Hello, everybody. I'm Father Michael Salvagni of the Passionist Community. I'm standing in the beautiful sanctuary of the National Basilica of St. Anne in Scranton, Pennsylvania. We are here for a special presentation today. As you know, the passion and death of Jesus was the greatest love story in history. Our Heavenly Father sent His only beloved Son to be among us, to teach us the ways of God, how we might come into the kingdom of heaven. But the sins of humanity, your sins and mine, causes death in an ugly way in the Roman crucifixion. We want to recall that event, and we want to especially see the connection of that with the beautiful Shroud of Turin that will be presented to you today. We are happy to have with us Mr. Donald Nose, who is a married man with children from Babylon, New York, who has studied the Passion for so many years and has studied the Shroud of Turin. He is the uh, Associate Director of the Confraternity of the Passion International, stationed in Jamaica, New York. And so here is Don Nose. The Confraternity of the Passion International is just that. It's an international lay organization, meaning it's, it's similar to a third order. It's not the ordained ministry, but it's, it's the lay class. Um, we are an international organization, as, and as you said, headquartered in Jamaica, New York. We meet once a month at the Immaculate Conception Monastery, the Passionist Monastery in Jamaica, Queens, New York. Like any other organization, over the years, we have seen membership dwindle to drastically low numbers. Um, but recently, there seems to be in a great influx of people, lay people and ordained, interested in the passion of Jesus. There is a sort of passion phenomenon occurring at this time in our history. We are hearing from people all over the world that would like to become members of the Confraternity of the Passion International. Father Joseph Dunstan Gazinski is the general director of the Confraternity of the Passion International. And Father Richard Shiner and myself are the associate general directors of the Confraternity of the Passion International. We have social members, uh, meaning you can, you can join but not necessarily have to take vows. Uh, we have uh, temporary vows. And if you would like, we also have permanent or perpetual vows. And we take the same vows as the ordained clergy, uh, the vows of poverty, chastity, obedience. And we take a fourth vow, and that is to promote the passion of Jesus. Well, you know, you really are so immersed in the passion of Jesus. For over 40 years, you studied it, prayed through it. And I'd like to know the history, how you got into it, who influenced you to do this? When I was, um, I was actually eight years old, uh, I used to go into the Passionist Monastery in Jamaica, Queens, um, with my father and uh, a couple of my brothers. We used to help make rosary beads. We would go down in the basement of the monastery and help make rosary beads with the little needle nose pliers and bending the wires and putting the beads on. And there was a passionist priest that was very close to myself and to my family, and that was Father Bryce Inglesby. Father Bryce Inglesby, um, one night, while we were making rosaries, there was a lot of people downstairs, but he singled me out, and he says, Donald, come here. And I came over to Father Bryce, and we stood in the corner. And Father Bryce said, Donald, I feel compelled to tell you this. And I'm looking up at him, and I said, what is it, Father? He said, Donald, every day of your life, say the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary. And I looked up at Father Bryce, and, and I said, Father, the whole rosary? Every day? <laughs> now, he knew this was coming from an eight-year-old. So he said, Donald, every day of your life, say the fifth decade, the crucifixion. And I did. From that day until this, I make sure doesn't matter where I am, what I'm doing. I could be at the beach, I could be at a movie theater, I could be sitting in a bar, but I would make sure that I said that fifth decade, the crucifixion of Jesus every day of my life, from that point to this. That is what instilled in me the passion. Father Bryce died when I was about 10 years old. I was deeply honored. I was asked by the Passionist community if I would like to be an altar boy to serve at his 
funeral at St. Michael's Monastery in Union City, New Jersey. And I carried the processional cross for my favorite priest, uh, my favorite saintly priest, Father Bryce Inglesby. From that point, after Father Bryce's death, God provided another very solid spiritual director for my family. Father Emmanuel guided me from my early teens up into my 20s. It's Father Emmanuel that gave me my first book on the Shroud of Turin. And this is that actual first book, A Doctor at Calvary. It's not in the same shape as when he first handed it to me, Yes. but this is the original book. Uh, what's unique is you could tell how many times I've read yes. this uh, by the way it appears. Um, but it does. It has this, the seal of the Immaculate Conception Monastery. Uh, this was about 42 years ago. Uh, I took this out of the library. So if I had to return it now, I wouldn't be able to afford the, the fine. But Father Emmanuel Garden is the one that gave me the book uh, that started me on studying the Shroud. When I was a teenager, I received a phone call from a friend of mine, um, and she told me, Don, there's a woman in New Jersey that would like to meet you. Her name is Mama Jilly, and she has a message for you from God. Mama was a mystic, and under spiritual direction from Father Emmanuel, he said, go, hear what Mama has to say, and then come back to me, and we'll discuss it. So I did. Uh, we made arrangements. I went to New Jersey, met Dolores Immaculata Gili, affectionately known as Mama Gili. She sat me down, and she said, Donald, I have a message from God for you. And she proceeded to say, God wants you to promote his holy shroud. Now, a period of time went by, and I didn't pay too much attention to that message, although at that time, it did affect me. And Father Emmanuel, after I discussed it with him, said, well, give it time, and, and we'll see what develops. Sure enough, after a number of years, I had remembered what Mama said, and that's exactly what I've been doing, promoting the Holy Shroud of Jesus. So there was much credence to what Mama had to tell me. Archbishop McCarrick started a committee to investigate Mama's life to see if there is enough evidence to start a cause for her canonization. King Umberto used to visit Mama. Now, King Umberto was the personal, private owner of the Holy Shroud of Jesus. King Umberto was living in Portugal at this time when he had met Mama, and they corresponded frequently. And King Umberto would visit Mama in her humble little home in New Jersey. Mama would be home and ready to receive a king in her humble little home with about half a dozen limousines pulling up and the king getting out to come visit Mama and discuss the Shroud of Turin and the Holy Face devotion. This emblem here, the rose, was from my mom's casket. My mom was very devoted to the Holy Face of Jesus, and I buried a picture of the Holy Face with my mom uh, when she was buried. The Pieta is from my father's casket. My father uh, helped me over the years as I acquired uh, everything that we see here. He helped me make the frames. Um, he was very devoted to Jesus, very devoted to his family, and he enjoyed, you know, seeing the presentations. So he helped me. He helped me over the years put all, everything we see here together. Don, and that's a, how it started. It's a fascinating testimony of the different people who were influential in your life, starting when you were eight years old and leading through passionate uh, connections, but also through other lay people, certainly your mother and father. And it's a testimony to how, you know, God works with ordinary people and does great things with them. You know, the devotion to the passion is spread by the pastor's community of priests, brothers, and sisters, but our lay people do it as well. And you have a unique calling of 40 years of devotion as well as 25 years of presentation. So I want to thank you for being faithful to that calling 
and the tremendous influence you've had on thousands of people through the years. Thank you, Father. We're in the sanctuary here of St. Anne's Basilica in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And right behind us is a beautiful replica of the Shroud of Turin. And I'd like Don Nost now to describe to us what we're looking at. Don? Yeah, um, what we see behind us is an exact replica of what you see in Turin, of the Holy Shroud of Jesus. This is the positive image. Now this image came from Barry Schwartz, who was a very good friend of mine. Uh, Barry was the official photographer for the Sturp team in 1978 that studied the Shroud of Turin. Uh, but he was a, the official photographer, and he manufactures uh, these replicas now. Uh, there are others available, but, but Barry's is, the, the quality is, is unmatched. Uh, so this is exactly what you see in Turin. These panels here are the negative images of Jesus. The shroud has negative qualities embedded into the image, not into the cloth, but into the image. These panels came from the Holy Shroud Guild, which was commissioned by the church to spread awareness of the Holy Shroud of Jesus. Well, you know, Don, to talk about the shroud, the images here, means we have to go back to the scripture reference to this. And I'd like to read a passage for everyone from John chapter 19, which is the burial of Jesus. It says, after this, after Jesus died, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted it. And so he came and took the body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices according to the Jew Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. So here we have a very direct account, and the other evangelists, the synoptics, also talk about the burial cloth of Jesus, but it was plural here. What does this all mean? First of all, you're right. It is very important to establish a start point for the shroud, and we see that in the Gospels. Uh, now, in Greek, the word syndon is used, which literally means sh uh, burial shroud. Uh, that's the literal meaning for the word syndon in the original Greek. That's important for a shroud researcher. We have that start point in the Gospels. You're right, Father, about um, plural uh, burial cloths. John does say in his Gospel, in a particular passage, uh, John 20, the empty tomb narrative, he mentions uh, burial linens or burial cloths in mm -hmm. the plural. Um, to respond, first of all, I'd like to read from Pope Benedict XVI's brand new book, Jesus of Nazareth, because the Holy Father brings up the Holy Shroud. And usually when I'm asked about does the church um, claim the authenticity of the Shroud, uh, which I'll get into a little bit later, uh, the church as a church does not, but individually, individual popes do uh, accept the Shroud as the authentic burial Shroud of Jesus. So I'd like to refer to Pope Benedict's book because he does take the time to bring up the Holy Shroud. And he goes on to say, equally important is the indication that Joseph brought a linen cloth in which he wrapped the corpse. Whereas the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uses the singular linen sheet. John uses the plural linen cloths in keeping with Jewish burial customs. Now, the Holy Father goes on to say, the question of matching this description to the Turin shroud need not detain us here. In any case, the shape of that relic can in principle be harmonized with both accounts, meaning with John in the plural and the synoptics in the singular. Uh, we don't have a problem with either linen cloth or the plural cloths there were more than one burial cloth 
cloths in the tomb at that time. Um, and when we recite John 20, we'll see that. The women go to the tomb to finish anointing the body of Jesus. Upon entering the tomb, they don't find the body. And that's what they report. The Gospels tell us they run to the apostles and they tell the apostles, somebody took the body of our Lord and we don't know what they did with it. At this time, they did not know that Jesus had to resurrect. The Gospels then tell us that Peter and John go running to the tomb. John, being the younger, arrives at the tomb first. Now, we know the tomb was low because the Gospels tell us that John stooped down mm -hmm. to look in yes. and saw the burial linens lying. Now, neither John nor Peter ever mention about not finding the body of Jesus. And that's what they went looking for, not burial cloths. They went looking to find a body. The Gospels tell us that Peter then arrived at the tomb, and Peter entered the tomb. Now, John bothers to tell us that he saw the burial linens lying. When he stooped down, looked in, saw the burial linens lying, but I did not go in. Now, meaning, he wants us to know there was something special about these cloths mm -hmm. and that he did not disturb anything. He waited outside and let Peter go before him. Again, Peter arrives at the tomb and enters the tomb and sees the burial linens lying and the napkin that had been about the head of Jesus, not with the rest of the burial cloths, but depending upon the translation, either still in its folds or folded by itself in a place by itself. And that's the holy sudarium, the, the holy napkin that covered the face of Jesus while he was on the cross. The Gospels then tell us, and then John entered the tomb, and he saw, and he believed. Mm -hmm. Now, what did John see, and what did John believe? If you know the theme of John's whole gospel, he tells us, these things were written so you will come to know that Jesus is the Son of God. So we know that that's the conclusion that John came to at that moment in the sepulcher, was that Jesus was the Son of God. It was not the resurrection. The very next sentence tells us, as if yet they did not know that Jesus had to resurrect. So it was that Jesus was the Son of God. That's the conclusion that John came to at that moment. What a conversion story at that moment for John the Evangelist. And he's telling us he saw something. Now, in order for a devout Jew to come to that kind of a conclusion that a man is the Son of God, he must have seen something awesome. Mm, yes. And we believe... It was the image on this cloth. That gospel does not tell us that Peter was affected. And this makes perfect sense. Peter, looking at this image, would say, well, that's not Jesus. That's somebody else beaten to a pulp. Mm -hmm. John knew this was Jesus. John helped bury Jesus. Peter deserted Jesus. John helped place Jesus in his burial shroud, knew exactly what Jesus looked like in burial, Therefore, John was the one that was converted at that moment. Well, Don, you know, the big question is, how authentic is this shroud? What does the Roman Catholic Church teach about it? So can you share that with us? Sure. The Roman Catholic Church, um, first of all, will never say that this is indeed the authentic burial shroud of Jesus. Even if carbon dating dated this cloth to the first century, the church still will not say that definitively this is the burial shroud of Jesus. But establishing an authenticity is very crucial, and especially to Christians in the first century. Uh, without this shroud, Christianity as we know it today would still be in existence, but probably not at the point that we are today. And what I mean by that is this, and I'm going to refer to Pope Benedict XVI's book again. If in the early creedal formula from Jerusalem, transmitted by St. Paul, it is stated that Jesus, according to the scriptures, 
then surely Psalm 16 must have been seen as key scriptural evidence for the early church. Here, they found a clear statement that Christ, the definitive David, will not see corruption, that he must truly have risen. Now, Pope Benedict goes on to explain not to see corruption. This is virtually a definition of resurrection. Once the body has decomposed, once it has broken down into its elements, mocking man's disillusion and return to dust, then death had conquered. Now, from this point of view, it is fundamental for the early church that Jesus' body did not decompose. Acts tell us that Jesus appeared to his apostles in the upper room, alive, by many proofs after his passion. Now, it doesn't say his resurrection, but it says after his passion. Now, what did Jesus have that showed he had a passion? Well, he had his burial shroud. The condition of the shroud or the image in this cloth tells us that this body did not see corruption. The shroud does reveal so much to us about Jesus, as we know. But one key element is that we know Jesus resurrected in three days. There is no sign of putrefaction or decomposition on the bodily image of Jesus in his burial shroud. That was important for the Christians in the first century. As Pope Benedict states, if this body did decay, we don't have a resurrection. Now that's to a first century way of thinking. Of course, today we know that if somebody is cremated, uh, that they will still resurrect uh, uh, in, in a glorified body. But for the first century Christian, and especially for a Jewish convert, it was important to establish Psalm 1610. You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption, and that's indeed what we see in the shroud. No sign of decomposition, which would have occurred after four days. And we get that from the Gospels also, when, when uh, Jesus goes to raise his friend Lazarus. And Lazarus' sister, Mary, says to Jesus, Jesus, maybe you better not raise him because he's been dead four days now, and by now he stinks. So putrefaction or decomposition sets in after three days. So we know Jesus resurrected before three days, and that's why it's important to establish the authenticity of this burial cloth, and Jesus established that. There is so much more that leads to this burial cloth being the authentic burial cloth of Jesus. As we mentioned earlier, there are 3D qualities built into the image on this cloth, and we're going to explore that. If we look at the blood flow, this is Jesus' right forearm. The blood flow down the forearm is constant. It's a constant flow, although it does change direction every once in a while. And if we follow that blood flow, we see there's a blood clot off the image. Now, we have a problem with that. And looking at the blood flow on the head, these white lines and marks is blood. This is blood flow or blood clots. But it's positioned off image, so we have a problem with that. But we're going to see that the placement of this blood is precisely where it should be and indeed is proof that this cloth was wrapped around a 3D body. I'm going to ask Don to come up and help me demonstrate this. Okay, Don. If you take an object, a picture or a cloth, while it's flat, and you're going to see these cutouts match up with these white stains on the shroud while the cloth is flat. If you take that cloth and wrap it around a 3D head, okay, just hold your ears with your four fingers, like this, and then color in those cutouts
like so. We're going to see when this cloth flattens out, I have it now, that these blood clots move off image and the blood stains will be out about where my thumbs are, out here now, off the image, while the cloth is flat. But we'll see that this is proof that the blood clots are precisely where they should be, running down the temples and around the forehead. This is precisely where you would see the blood. But what happened is the cloth was flattened out while Jesus, when he resurrected. Okay, we're going to show you now how Jesus was buried in his cloth. Okay, lay flat down on your back. They positioned Jesus just like we see here, flat on his back on half the cloth. Then they grabbed the other end of the cloth and simply came around and placed it over the body. And because this is a fine linen, we'll see that it picks up the blood flow immediately as soon as the cloth is placed on the body. It picks up the blood flow immediately. There were two image applications. The blood was applied first. Three days later, when Jesus resurrected, the image was applied. But the blood clots were off image. So we had to determine what caused the cloth to be flat when Jesus resurrected. If you remember from the Gospels, the women were coming back to finish anointing the body of Jesus. So they went out while the men put the body in the cloth the women went out and picked flowers. We know from the Gospels they placed spices with the body. They didn't do that. They were going to come back to finish anointing the body three days later. So they had to keep it preserved, a sweet smelling. So when they picked the flowers, they lifted the cloth to place the flowers in with the body. And we'll see when we lift this cloth, these blood stains move off image like that. They place the flowers alongside the body, and now the clots are out here, off image. Okay. So three days later, Jesus resurrects. His bodily image is applied between the blood clots. The blood clots are no longer on the forehead, they're out here. So it appear that it's matted out in his hair. Well, you know, Don, it's important for us now to move right into the passion of Jesus and the horror of the Roman crucifixion and the implements that we use. So please prepare our people for what you're going to share. Sure. The passion of Jesus, as revealed in his shroud, complements the Gospels, and the Gospels certainly complement the shroud. But before we see what the shroud has to reveal about the passion of Jesus, maybe we just take a moment to prepare ourselves uh, to contemplate what we are going to see and hear. I'm also usually asked <clears throat> if the, there was a connection uh, between the shroud or the passion of Jesus and the divine mercy. Uh, and just to briefly make that connection, I refer to St. Faustina's diary and a particular paragraph, 1320. At three o'clock, implore my mercy, especially for sinners, and if only for a brief moment, immerse yourself in my passion. This is the hour of great mercy for the whole world. I will allow you to enter into my mortal sorrow. In this hour, I will refuse nothing to the soul that makes a request of me in virtue of my passion. I just wanted to establish that loving, powerful passion of Jesus. Um, God does not make mistakes. We have this image. There's a divine purpose for this image, which is just being revealed now. It's within God's divine providence. God reveals the passion of his son. And I think in a future video, we're going to make that connection with the divine mercy. That connection is there. The three o'clock hour is the passion and death of Jesus. It's the passion that we offer up to God for the sake of your sorrowful passion. 
have mercy on us and on the whole world. So that's there. That's already established. We'll get more into that in a second DVD. But to prepare ourselves here and now for what we're going to see, what the Shroud reveals about the passion of Jesus, I'd like for us to think for a moment this dogma of faith. God died for love of man. Now think about that for a moment. God died for love of man. At this time in our history, especially as Christians, God wants us to know precisely what it was like for him as a father to experience the passion of his son. He reveals that to us in the Bible, and in particular, the story of Abraham and Isaac. If you remember the Bible, God says to Abraham, Abraham, take your son Isaac, your one and only son, whom you love very much, and offer him as a holocaust, sacrifice to me. Now, God bothered to say, your one and only son, whom you love very much. And Abraham said, okay, God. Now, the Bible tells us it was a three-day journey. Now, as a parent, you can imagine what Abraham was going through. His stomach must have been turning in knots, knowing that he was going to sacrifice his one and only son, whom he loved very much. And after three days, they arrive at the place of the sacrifice, and Abraham takes the firewood, and he gives it to his son Isaac, and he takes the dagger and the torch, and they proceed to the altar. And little Isaac looks up at his father, and he says, Father, we have the firewood and the dagger and the torch, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Little did he know that he was to be that sacrifice. But Abraham said to his son, Son, don't worry. God himself will provide the lamb for the sacrifice. And how prophetic those words were. See, Abraham proceeded to sacrifice his son, and an angel of the Lord stopped him. Abraham, lay not a hand upon your son. I know now you are obedient. God stopped Abraham from sacrificing his one and only son, whom he loved very much. But God did not stop himself from sacrificing his one and only son, whom he loves very much. From the beginning of creation, God preordained himself to be that sacrifice. He knows we're good people, but we just don't have anything good enough to offer him to make up for that sin. God himself provided that for us. Our good God stepped up to the plate for us, and he wants us to know that, and he wants us to know what he endured as a father. He does have feelings and emotions. I'm well pleased in my son. I'm upset with creation. I'm going to destroy it with a flood. I'm upset with my people worshiping a golden calf. God reveals he does have emotions. And he wants us to know at this time in our history what he endured. So let us now see exactly what God did endure and what his son Jesus did go through in his passion. Okay, we're going to look at what the shroud has to reveal about the passion of Jesus and the holy instruments that were used in the passion of Jesus Looking at the shroud, the shroud stays within the context of prophecy or scripture. Uh, Isaiah and his prophecy of the Messiah tells us that not a sound spot will be left on this body, and there isn't. From head to foot, there's over 120 scourge marks on the back of Jesus. This is the front of Jesus, this is the front image of Jesus. The other panel is the rear or dorsal image of Jesus. And they arrested Jesus, and they brought Jesus to Caiaphas. 
Now, while Jesus was with Caiaphas, the soldiers abused Jesus. They kicked Jesus, they spit on Jesus, and they punched Jesus. And if we look at the prophecy of Isaiah again, he gave his cheeks to the strikers and his beard to the pluckers. Revealed in the shroud is we see this dark image on the chin of Jesus. In all likelihood, they grabbed Jesus by his beard and yanked him down to the ground and pulling out a clump of hair out right out of his chin, a clump of beard. And we see the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. He gave his chin to the pluckers and they pulled a piece of Jesus' beard right out of his chin. Jesus was put in a dungeon overnight. It was cold. He shivered. We know it was cold. The Gospels tell us that Peter followed and sat in the outer courtyard around a fire to keep warm. So we know it was cold. So they put Jesus in the dungeon overnight, body on the verge of shock from the agony in the garden, that much of loss of sweat and blood, not eating, not sleeping, again on the verge of shock, cold, shivering all night. And the next morning, they take Jesus to Pilate. Now, Pilate did not want to have Jesus crucified. Pilate thought he would appease the people and have Jesus scourged. Now, if you saw the movie The Passion, what they used in that movie was a cat of nine tails. That's not what was used according to the shroud, although it does do the same damage. This is what was used. This is an authentic replica of a first century Roman flagrum. We know this is what was used according to the shroud. What a flagrum is, flagrum means short-handled whip. As two or three leather thongs of different lengths and either tipped with the ankle bones of sheep or dumbbell shaped lead balls just as we see here with little spikes or protrusions sticking out that was meant to embed itself into the individual's flesh and rip it out. These dumbbell shaped lead balls according to the shroud match perfectly with the scourge marks. So we know that this was the instrument that was used. The Romans were experts. They knew the damage they were going to do. They knew how to do it. Each leather thong was a different length for a very good reason. Because if these were the same lengths, they might take a chance on one overlapping the other end and not doing damage to a different part of the body. So the flagrum was made, the, the thongs in different lengths, so that with each strike, damage was done to a different part of the body. Jesus was scourged in the nude, according to the shroud, in front of his mother and in front of his friends. The embarrassment that Jesus endured, looking at his mom, his mom crying, and him trying to keep her strong and enduring his own scourging. And you were bent over and tied to a whipping post. And there was a reason for that. When they, when they tie you over, your skin stretches. The flagrum opens the skin. And when they're done with you, they stand you up and those wounds close and cause excruciating pain. Then they took Jesus. Now Matthew's account tells us Jesus was abused by the whole praetorium, or by the whole cohort in the praetorium. Now a cohort in the first century was between five and six hundred men. So it's a lot of people shoving Jesus around, kicking Jesus, and spitting on Jesus and abusing Jesus. After they abused Jesus, they sat Jesus on a stump and put a robe around him. And according to the burial shroud, this is what was used to be placed on his head, the crown of thorns. Looking at the dorsal image of Jesus, there are between 50 and 75 puncture wounds around the whole scalp of Jesus. It's not a ringlet like we're used to seeing depicted in art. It is a whole cap of thorns. 
This was from a plant readily available in the environs of Jerusalem. The Gospels tell us they wove a crown of thorns. So it was something that was available right there. And they placed it on the head of Jesus. And then they put the cross to Jesus. And Jesus carried his cross. And Jesus carried just his cross piece, which would have weighed approximately 110 to 120 pounds. Not a full cross, as we're typically used to thinking Jesus carried, which weighed about 300 pounds. A healthy man would not have been able to drag a full cross for the distance that Jesus did from the Praetorium to Gol Golgotha. Looking at the dorsal image of the shroud, or the back of Jesus, we notice the wounds over the right shoulder are smeared and under the left scapula, indicative of Jesus carrying his cross piece diagonal across his back, high to the right, low to the left, which would be indicative of Jesus being right-handed also. The way Jesus carried his cross piece Okay, Father, if you don't mind helping me, just tie that loop around my left ankle and then tighten it up. Okay, thank you. This is precisely how Jesus carried his cross piece as revealed in his holy shroud. The left side was tied to the left ankle. The right side was tied to the individual in front of you, and you were tied to your cross piece. The reason for this is because this was actually your first set of handcuffs. They had to keep you confined. If you were on your way to be crucified and you saw an alley, you would be tempted to drop your cross piece and take off down an alley. You being tied to it prevented you from doing that. The left side, again, was tied to your left ankle, right side to the individual in front. And the reason for that is so that you couldn't use your cross piece as a weapon. You couldn't whack the guards with it. Okay, they kept you co totally confined. But this is what caused Jesus to fall. On the way to Golgotha, the other two victims were being whipped on the way to Golgotha. And when you are whipped, you jerk. Jesus being the last in line, when they were whipped, they jerked. And this jerked Jesus' cross piece up when Jesus' left leg and down Jesus went, mostly on his left knee. Okay, Father, if you could just please take this back off. Under close examination of the shroud, we see Jesus fell mostly on his left knee. Tradition tells us that Jesus fell three times. We don't get that from the Gospels, but that's fine. Jesus would go down, slam his left knee on the ground, and then smack his face on the pavement. Traces of limestone were found on different areas of the face, indicative of Jesus falling many times. But we'll go with the three times. But Jesus would fall. Down Jesus would go, smack his face on the pavement. The only thing that saved Jesus' skull from being crushed by his cross piece is because when he went down and his face went down, the cross piece came down, but because it was tied to the individual in front, the rope got taut and stopped the cross piece just short of crushing Jesus' skull. After Jesus carried his cross, they placed the cross piece down in front of the upright, and they nailed Jesus to his cross piece. Now, according to the burial shroud, they placed the nail in the wrist of Jesus. And these are what were used. These are first century Roman roofing nails. Roofing nails in the first century were not even cut. They were different lengths, handmade. You would have a lot of these in a pail and they would take them out and use the shorter ones for the wrist and the longer ones for the feet. But the nails were introduced in the wrist affixing Jesus to his cross piece. This is a typical Roman Tau cross. This is what was used in first century Roman crucifixions. When they affixed you to your cross piece, they simply lifted this up, and because of the pain, you stood up with it, and they would place you on the upright and drive a spike through your feet. After a while, Jesus expired on his cross. Jesus died. And one of the soldiers took 
this, a first century Roman thrusting spear, and introduced this right between the fifth and sixth rib of Jesus, inserting it, severing his heart, and almost coming out his back. The burial shroud of Jesus was always greatly venerated in the early church. The church never doubted the authenticity of this wonderful relic that we have from God. The Orthodox have a tradition that the burial shroud of Jesus was used as the first altar cloth. We're, we're going to look at that in one moment. The Byzantines actually venerate the Holy Shroud. Most other rites, in fact, all of the other rites, outside of our Latin or Western rite, which most of us here are, actually venerate the Holy Shroud on Great and Holy Saturday. We have here, this is a Byzantine shroud, a holy shroud. This shroud is venerated every Great and Holy Friday. The priest will take this shroud out of a frame in the wall, place it around his shoulders like so, pin it, and process, weather permitting, outside the church and stop at all four corners of the church or inside and read from one of the four Gospels. Then he will take the shroud off and place it in the sepulchre. And the people, with great compunction in their heart, process up and they venerate Jesus in his burial shroud. The Orthodox tend to get very elaborate, and that's okay. They like to depict, indeed, what's taking place. Jesus being buried in his burial shroud. So on Great and Holy Friday, this will be placed in a sepulchre. On Easter morning, the priest comes back, takes the shroud out of the sepulchre, again, under great procession, processes with the shroud, and then places it on the altar where it remains for 40 days until the Feast of the Ascension, where it's then placed back in its frame. But the Eucharist is celebrated on the burial shroud of Jesus. In the first century, the actual burial cloth was indeed the first altar cloth. And we're going to see in a moment, Father, if you bring the shroud... There was no corporal, as we know today. It was one long altar cloth, which represented the burial shroud of Jesus. In the first century, there was one chalice, but you brought your own unleavened, or at that time, leavened bread from home, and they would choose from among the different loaves which ones they were going to use to consecrate, and they would place it along the table, and they would take the ends of the altar cloth and fold it back over the gifts, just like this. And the bishop at that time would consecrate the gifts. And this would become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Transubstantiation, just like the resurrection, takes place within the burial shroud of Jesus. You cover and enfold the body and blood of our Lord. Now, this goes back to our Jewish roots. If you saw the movie, The Passion, you saw the Blessed Mother, Father, yes, cleaning right. the blood with the cloth. A very touching scene. That would be the purificator. The purificator is what the priest uses to clean the vessels. After communion, he will put water into the chalice to wash any species, consume, and then use the purificator to clean the vessels. This has to stay with the cloths. But the cloth that the Blessed Mother used represented the purificator that we have in our Catholic liturgy. You must contain the body and blood of Jesus. The Byzantines, again, celebrate the Eucharist on this. This is a Byzantine anti-mention. 
This is not mm. just the equivalent of our Latin Rite Corporal. This is actually a portable altar. In it is depicted exactly what's taking place during the liturgy. Jesus being buried in his burial shroud and was a resurrect in the Eucharist. This is usually signed by the bishop, given to the priest upon his ordination, and this anti-mention stays with the priest for his whole priestly life. And the Eucharist is celebrated on the burial shroud of Jesus. We, as you are, Father, are more familiar with this cloth. Right, the corporal. Corporal means body. In 325, Pope Sylvester decreed that the Eucharist will be celebrated on the corporal as if it is the burial shroud of Jesus and must be made of a pure white linen, as is the burial shroud. So this is why our Latin Rite Corporal is a plain white linen. That was decreed in 325. Yes. But we also want to get as real as possible. This is exactly what the shroud was like, a pure white linen. Today, the Eucharist, after a couple of centuries, got smaller. You didn't bring your own bread from home. The altar cloth got smaller. We still have the long altar cloth. But again, now we have the corporal. Now, for our Catholic viewers, this is not consecrated, so uh, don't get nervous. Mm -hmm. But you will bring the gifts up to the altar, and you place them on the side. And then the priest will offer up what at this time is bread, and then place it on the corporal, or anti-mention. Now, because the corporal is too small to fold back over the gifts, we now use a pall. Now, the practical reason for the pall is to stop undesirables from falling into the precious blood. But the real reason for the pall is because you must cover and enfold the body and blood of Jesus, which some orthodox rites will actually do, is take the corners of the anti-mention and cover the body as we see here. This receives the same blessing as the corporal. Can only be blessed by the bishop or a priest that's given the faculties to do so by his bishop. The wording in that blessing is to receive the body and blood of Jesus. You must cover and enfold the body and blood of Jesus. Actually what takes place in the liturgy is preparing Jesus for the resurrection. We were preparing the dead body. At Mass, you will also have a cross with a corpus on it. A cross accepted the live body of Jesus and gave it back to us dead. But the shroud accepted the dead body of Jesus, just like we see here in the liturgy, and gave it back to us alive. Transubstantiation, just like the resurrection, takes place within the burial shroud of Jesus. That's a beautiful connection, you know, that I don't recall in our formation, maybe it was there, to see the, the power of the, the shroud connected with the celebration of Eucharist and all the symbols of the, the linens and the beautiful uh, imagery that's connected in that. You express it so beautifully. So that every element, every piece, it's on the altar, is precious, is sacred, you know, and it's something we reverence. What, in, what intrigued me as a researcher, and someone also that's studied early liturgical development, uh, is I always have to keep in mind that our first bishops were from Jewish tradition. Uh, you could not touch a burial cloth full of blood. You would become defiled. So what would possess the first bishops to celebrate the Eucharist on the actual burial cloth of Jesus. It's because when Jesus was on earth, everything changed. Again, even Jewish tradition, the idea was if you take something pure and touch it to something defiled, the pure becomes defiled. Now with Jesus, it's just the opposite. Anything that's dirty that touches the pure now becomes pure 
it changed with Jesus. The woman with the flow of blood for 12 years said, if only I touch the hem of his garment, I shall be healed. And she was made clean. Her defilement touching clean Jesus made her clean. So our whole development of the liturgy changed from the early centuries. Well, you know how we carried over to the idea of healing. Before we receive Holy Communion, we say, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. And while we might think physical healing like that woman with the issue of blood, we have all other kinds of need for healing too, mental, emotional, spiritual. So all happens right here and all the time. That's beautiful. Don, that was a beautiful and inspiring presentation on the passion and death of Jesus and how the Holy Shroud fits in with all of that. And your years of study uh, really did you well today. I want to thank you for presenting that to us, to all who will view this, because we want to get the word out more and more, the message of God's love to his people. Our holy founding, O St. Paul the Cross said, the passion of Christ is an ocean of sorrow, but all the more it is an ocean of love. So we want to see it as God's love for you and for me, for everybody else. So thank you very much. God bless you and uh, success in your continued presentations. And now you have a, a special image you'd like to introduce us to. We opened up the cabinet that contains the holy face of Jesus. Before we looked at the passion, we were invited to contemplate what we were seeing and hearing, to put the passion of Jesus in our hearts, in our minds, and in our souls. With that accomplished, we're going to be asked at this time to come up and venerate this holy image, the holy face of Jesus, with the understanding that with a touch or a kiss as an act of reparation for what Jesus suffered in his passion, that touch or that kiss passes through this image and you kiss or touch the face of Jesus in heaven in a very real sense right here, right now. And for the viewers at home, you also are invited up to touch your TV screens with the intention of soothing the wounds of Jesus. And at that moment, asking Jesus to have mercy on us and on the whole world. Yes, we are blessed and fortunate to have these presentations that inspire us in our devotion to Jesus and make us realize that we have a tangible contact with Jesus in this blessed shroud.